So welcome back to Alpha. Uh, tonight we're taking up this question, why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? Um, an opening question here. Not that we need any help talking tonight. Um, a favorite summer memory is, so there's no wrong answers here, just what's a favorite summer memory of yours? Well, I could offer one. I love lazy afternoons on on a sun bleach something or other, and just uh, being together with Julie and uh, enjoying the day. Nice. Yes, John. Uh, well, Rosemary just reminded me that today we went back and visited the very spot where we got married on July twenty sixth, about thirty six. Years ago, in the summertime, mm. overlooking the rowing pond in Central Park. Wow, that's awesome. Hardly changed. A favorite, favorite summer memory for me was um, when I was younger, I had a keen interest in the space program, mm -hmm. and I thought it was really neat uh, in July how we landed a man on the moon in 1969. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Well, for me it would be water skiing mm, yeah that's fun nice anyone else a uh, favorite memory of mine as a little girl was going to Nashville when I lived in Atlanta and spending two weeks with uh, my cousin up there and my relatives, but mainly my cousin. Yeah. And we all, I just love Nashville always. And so that's a really good memory. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Good. Fireflies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. One of my favorite summer memories is autumn. <laughs> <Looking forward to it. laughs> yeah, I mean, that sounds like I don't really enjoy summer, but uh, <laughs> but it, it's the coming of autumn that's yeah. to me spectacular. I do enjoy summer. <laughs> All right, one more question here. This one's a little more difficult. What's, what is one phrase you'd use to finish this sentence? Jesus died. What comes to your mind? What's a phrase that you'd use to finish that sentence? Because he loved me. Mm, okay, very good. Uh, mine is uh, pretty similar. It's it's for us. Mm. Good. Yeah, there are all sorts of ways to expand on what Debbie said. I mean, mm -hmm. to me. It, the love of God is at the heart of it, died to reveal the love of God. But the utter simplicity of what Debbie said kind of uh, trumps everything else you come up with. Yeah. Robert? Debbie makes me think of John 3.16. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world. Yeah. Well, the video tonight is going to look at 
several reasons behind the death of Jesus. Um, it's it's going to mention four. It's it's not as explicit as as this slide makes it seem. You you have you got to listen kind of hard to get these four, but they're woven woven throughout there. Um, that Jesus died to prove God's love, a demonstration of God's love. Jesus died to take our sin. Now the video tonight's going to going to major on that one. The the bulk of the video revolves around uh, different expressions of that same truth, um, the substitutionary atonement. Uh, but it also mentions Jesus dying to know our suffering, the solidarity that, that we have with Jesus, because he, he knows what it's like to suffer through the cross, and, and that Jesus died to show us how to live, that because, because of, what Jesus, of how Jesus loved on the cross, we, we learn how to love as well. And we looked at this slide at Easter time, and I just bring it up as a reminder that <clears throat> while this video will major on this first one, Jesus provided a substitution, there, there are lots of other reasons in Scripture, explanations in Scripture for why Jesus died. And it's very useful to keep the, the, the panoply of reasons in mind uh, because different, different ones will probably resonate with us in different seasons of life. So the, the video will uh, touch on a few of these, the, the substitution, the, the proof that God shows his love for us, um, the solidarity and the example, and then some of the other ones here, it, it will leave untouched. Um, but, but just to sort of plant that idea in, uh, in our mind before the video. So what I'd like to ask you to do is, is, as we watch this video, just write down one or two reasons for the death of Jesus that resonate most with you. And then we'll, we'll pick those up on the back side of it. This video is 28 minutes long, so it's a little bit longer than the, the previous two videos that we've looked at. Uh, but it's very well done, and there's some really uh, touching stories that are woven in through here as well as some good teaching. So I'm going to start the video, and then we'll talk on the other side of it. Uh, um, I have no idea. Why did Jesus die? Did you, did Jesus, I should really know this. Big question for early in the morning, isn't it? Jesus died for people, other people. Saving us. Was it Pontius Pilate probably got a bit jealous of Jesus getting all the birds? So we all die. People die for different reasons. Uh, to, well, it, it, I think it was supposed to be like for our sins, wasn't it? Jesus died because people didn't agree with him. Well, probably fear is why he died more than anything else. Didn't he like sacrifice himself on the cross? So. His choice. Jesus died because of people's beliefs. That's up for discussion. <laughs> Everybody dies. No one lives forever. cross is the symbol of the Christian faith. It's kind of like the logo of Christianity. About a third of the Gospels are about the death of Jesus and much of the rest of the New Testament is spent explaining why he died. I found that when I understood why Jesus had died, when I experienced what his death had achieved for me, it changed everything. Why did Jesus die? Well the answer is because he loves you. There's a verse in the New Testament where Paul says, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. You are loved. That's the message at the heart of the New Testament. And it's the message at the heart of this universe. If you had been the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you. It's as personal as that. 
He loves you that much. His love for you is unconditional, it's wholehearted, it's continual. It's the greatest love you could ever imagine. And that's the reason for the cross. It's God's amazing love for you. And that understanding completely changed my life. But why was it necessary? What's the problem? You're created in the image of God. God loves you. He created you. That means you're God's masterpiece. There's something amazing about every human being, something noble, something magnificent. Human beings are capable of such extraordinary creativity, music, art, literature. God's made you creative because you're created in his image. Human beings are capable of great self-sacrifice, devotion, kindness. But certainly in my case, there's another side to the coin. We're also capable of bad stuff. You only need to open the newspapers to see that terrible evil going on in this world. But the world is more complex than just saying, well, there are these evil people and they're good people, because it's more mixed than that. People who are capable of great love and devotion and kindness can also do some bad stuff. I've done some bad stuff in my life that I deeply regret. I've, I've hurt people, people that I love. The way the New Testament puts it is like this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word sin can sometimes make me think of religious guilt or things like luxury chocolates and ice cream. The phrase, this is sinful, has become synonymous with something enjoyable. I saw an advert for ice cream that said, it's so good, it's sinful. But sin in the Bible is much more profound and relevant to you and me today than we sometimes realize. We're not talking about accidental mistakes or eating too much chocolate, but our seemingly natural inclination to mess things up, to break stuff like promises and relationships that we care about and even our own well-being. And often we look around at others and think, OK, I get stuff wrong, sure, but comparatively, I'm not that bad, right? There are people doing far worse things than me. And if we're honest, we've all done stuff wrong. Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the glory of God was revealed in Jesus. And compared to him, we all fall a long way short. So you might say, well, in that case, we're all in the same boat. Why does it matter? But there are consequences to the things that we do wrong. And the New Testament describes the impact of sin in a few different ways. Just as the pollution of our environment is a major problem, Jesus said it's also possible to pollute your life, your heart. And this is the pollution of sin. The things we do wrong can spoil our lives. Sin poisons our relationships with one another. And it also spoils our relationship with God. The bad stuff in our lives is also addictive. Sin is powerful. Yeah, I resonate with what St Paul said. What I want to do, I do not do. What I hate, I do. Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. So for example, if you take heroin for a sustained period, you'll become addicted. But it's not just hard drugs. It's also possible to be addicted to things like a bad temper, envy, arrogance, pride, selfishness, slander, sexual immorality. This is the slavery that Jesus spoke about that has this destructive power over our lives. There is something in human nature that cries out for justice. Love and justice are not opposed. When we hear about a child being molested or about an elderly person being brutally attacked in their homes, we long for the people who do these things to be caught and punished because we believe there should be a penalty for sin. But it's not just other people's sins that deserve to be punished, it's ours as well. But it's easier to think about other people's and less so about ourselves. St Paul said, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. The things that we do wrong create a barrier. It's a bit like when you fall out with someone you love, like a family member or a close friend, and you can't look them in the eye. It's like there's something that's come between you. And the things that we do wrong, our sin, creates a partition, a barrier between us and God. And it's like the breakdown of a relationship, not just with God, but also all our relationships. That's the problem. That's the bad news. So what's the solution? Well, the good news is that God loves you. And he came to the earth in the person of his son to do something about it. 
to die for you and to die for me. The Apostle Peter puts it like this. He himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins in his body. By his wounds, you have been healed. It's been described as the self-substitution of God. What does that mean? On the 31st of July, 1941, sirens rang out from cell block 14 in Auschwitz concentration camp. A prisoner had escaped. And as a reprisal, the Gestapo selected 10 men, arbitrarily, to die in a starvation bunker. The ninth man selected was a man called Francis Gajewniczek. And when he was selected, Francis Gajewniczek cried out. He said, oh, he said, my poor wife and my children, they will never see me again. At that moment, a, a small man with wireframe glasses took off his cap and he walked forward and he said, I'm a Catholic priest. He said, I don't have a, a wife and children. I want to die instead of that man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. The name of that man was Maximilian Kolbe, 47 years old. And he was taken with the other nine to the starvation bunker. An amazing guy. He, he got them praying, singing hymns. Apparently the atmosphere in there was, felt like a church in there. Eventually they needed the starvation bunker for other people. And so on the 14th of August, 1941, he was given a lethal injection of carbolic acid. 41 years later, on the 10th of October, 1982, the death of Maximilian Kolbe was put in its proper perspective. There in St. Peter's Square, Rome, in a crowd of 150,000 people with 26 cardinals, 300 bishops and archbishops, was Francis Gajewniczek. And the Pope described the death of Maximilian Kolbe on that occasion in these terms. He said it was a victory like that one by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Maximilian Kolbe had died for someone else instead of someone else. That someone else was Francis Gajewniczek. I happened to see his obituary in the independent newspaper. He died at the age of 93. And he had spent the rest of his life going around the world telling people what Maximilian Kolbe had done for him because he had died in his place. And in an even more remarkable way, Jesus died instead of you and instead of me. Crucifixion was the height of pain and depth of shame. Yet interestingly, the New Testament doesn't dwell on the physical suffering, the torture, the crucifixion, because actually other people in history have died perhaps even more horrible deaths physically. Indeed, even now around the world, people are being crucified. But the suffering of Jesus was unique because not only was he suffering physically and emotionally, but he was suffering spiritually because he was bearing on himself your guilt and my guilt. The cross and the resurrection are like one event. And the results of the cross is like the different facets of a beautiful diamond. One facet is, it shows us just how much God loves you. Guilt is feeling bad about the stuff that we've done. Shame is feeling bad about who we are. And on the cross, Jesus took your guilt, your shame, my guilt, my shame. And therefore, there's no need for guilt or shame because you are loved. Your worth is what you're worth to God. And you are of infinite value to God because Jesus died for you. That's how much he loves you. Another facet is it shows the true nature of love. Love is not just a feeling. Love is more than words. 
It involves actions. Jesus demonstrated that. He showed his love by laying down his life for us. He sacrificed himself for us. My dad died a couple of years ago after about eight years of suffering from dementia. And it was by far the hardest thing that we as a family have had to deal with. Uh, seeing him go from the sort of loving father and dad and brilliant physicist that he was, um, sort of descending into this fog of memory loss and confusion and anger and fear. Uh, it was horrible to watch. And in those times, I remember asking seriously questions like, why? Why him? Why us? Why now? What possible purpose could that have? How could God allow that to happen to him? How can God allow that to happen to anyone? How can suffering happen when God loves us? And those are questions that crop up a lot in the Bible. You read in the Psalms questions about why is God so far away? And that's how it felt, was God was far away. And, and yet it's important to ask those questions. Being a Christian, believing in God doesn't mean you can't have doubts and ask questions the whole time. You know, Jesus himself cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But actually it was on the cross, it's the death, the suffering of Jesus and his death on the cross, which I found gave me not a complete answer, but some help as I was going through that because it helped me understand that God's not aloof, far away, sitting on some cloud, but actually he came in Jesus and suffered himself. He knows what it's like to suffer and he died. And therefore he understands what we're going through. If we're suffering, he's with us in that suffering. And eventually my dad uh, died, and actually, it sounds strange to say it, but it was a bit of a relief. And uh, I had this strange sense of peace all the way through. And a lot of that was to do with reading about Jesus' resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus shows us that death's not the end. That ultimately, Jesus has defeated death. And that even though we might suffer now, one day, there'll be no more suffering and there'll be no more pain. The resurrection was not the reversal of a defeat that had taken place on the cross. It was the manifestation of a victory. And what it tells us is that the bad stuff is not going to have the last word. You may be in difficult times. You may be really struggling with stuff. But evil will not have the last word because evil has been defeated on the cross. The story ends well. And then we see that the, the cross dealt with all these problems that we've seen about sin. Through the cross, the partition between us and God has been removed. You can come home to God. St. Paul puts it like this. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. It's not that on the cross God punished some innocent third party, Jesus. That would be barbaric. No. God himself came to this earth in the person of his son. God was in Christ reconciling you and me to God. It's like the prodigal son, the story which Jesus told of a son who'd, who'd gone away from home, who'd left his father, who'd wandered away, and then he comes back home. I love Charlie Mackesy's sculpture to illustrate the prodigal son. This picture of the father, the loving father that Jesus described, who when the son comes home, when you and I come home, he 
embraces us. He hugs us. He kisses us. He loves us. He holds us. We're reconciled to him. We can have this close, intimate relationship with the Father. And when we're reconciled to God, what I've found is that helps to bring reconciliation to all our other relationships. Jesus has paid the price. All you have to do is accept the free gift. It's not like buy one, get one free. It's more like buy none, get everything free, which sounds too good to be true. But we can't just go around and do what we like because we know we'll be forgiven every time. In fact, it's the opposite to that. Rather than being the reason to sin, it's an incentive not to sin. I got in with the wrong crowd and I started to um, pinch cars, burgle houses, uh, become known, me and my friends become known as very high profile thieves really. I used to carry big knives, uh, the, the big knives to the smaller knives down my waist and I was the kind of person where if you pulled a knife out I would use it. I ended up stabbing someone in the head. I ended up um, stabbing someone just missing his heart and going through the top of his shoulder, uh, the, the top of his chest and his shoulder away. He dropped to the floor and so I was on the run for two attempted murders. And then I was just, when I went to prison, I had such a hatred for the system and I couldn't handle being told what to do, couldn't handle prison officers mucking me about. When I went out on association, I got to prison officer and I, uh, I stabbed him. And then this led to me going into maximum security prisons, being put on CSC. It's where they feed you through a hatch in the door. There's no physical contact. So they have to have riot shields and riot gear on. Um, and that was my life for a long, long time, basically. And I, I just was going from prison to prison, prison to prison. But then I ended up going to Long Larton in Worcestershire. And when I was in there, I ended up going in an alpha course. Never heard of an alpha course, didn't know anything. And I just remember walking in because they'd sent me down. I sat down on a chair and I thought, oh no, it's a Christian thing. And we'd just go there every week and I would argue. And the pastor, um, I remember he come to me. He said, right, I'm going to say a few scriptures first before we pray. And one of them was, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And then he said the verses about Jesus and explained a bit why he died on the cross for sinners and stuff. And then he said, pray. So I started praying and I said, uh, God, I said, God, if you're real, come into my life because I hate who I am. And nothing happened. But then, as I was talking to the pastor, I started to feel this energy feeling in my stomach. And it started to raise up and raise up and raise up and raise up. And I just broke out into uncontrollable um, tears. And I just sobbed. <clears throat> and I just... Right there. Because that was a change in my whole life. I knew God was real. Um, and no one will change that now. And then I remember <laughs> running on the wing. People clearly knew that I would become a Christian. So I actually helped them on another two Alpha courses. And then I, I, um, I got released. I've been in a prison where I... Because you would have thought that the prison where I stopped the prison officers would have been the last prison to have me. But they were the first. That's how God works. The best thing for me is going in prisons and helping the lads in prison and, and trying to tell them about God. I've got five kids and they're my life. Um, and what upsets me is because now I know um, that back then, if I had the kids, uh, they wouldn't have had a good upbringing. And now they sit on the night and have Bible studies with their dad. Um, <clears throat> A Bible study with a dad, have a life, the beautiful, um, and my life. And this is probably is my wife and my kids are the best gift, that, apart from the grace God's given me, is the best gift I've ever, He'll ever give me. Um, Didn't expect to cry like that. Recovered now. Power of sin was broken through the cross. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, 
you will be free indeed. Our addictions are broken. Before I was a Christian, I had a terrible temple. My father had a terrible temple, and I had inherited it, and I thought, that's it. I'm going to have a terrible temper for life. But what I found was that Jesus set me free. Other areas of my life, it's been a much longer process, and there's still things that I, I struggle with. To use two, two theological terms, justification happens instantly. You are put right with God instantly through the cross. But sanctification, that's the process of becoming like Jesus. It's a much longer process. St. John writes, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We receive continual forgiveness. So we need to be continually forgiving. For me, experiencing God's forgiveness made all the difference. Before I was a Christian, if someone had offended me, I'd hold a grudge against that person. But holding a grudge is like allowing the person to live rent-free in your head. I used to hold on to unforgiveness, thinking that I was doing the other person harm. But now I can see that unforgiveness did far more harm to me than it did to the other person. As someone said, not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and hoping the other person's going to die. Once you've experienced God's forgiveness, since God forgives you, you have to forgive yourself. And that's what I find the hardest. But we have to forgive because as C.S. Lewis points out, not forgiving ourselves is like setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than God. If God forgives, you must forgive yourself. And we forgive others because we've been forgiven so much. Forgiveness is a choice, but it's not an option. And it's not easy. C.S. Lewis said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And then it's really hard. But it really is true that the first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. One of my great heroes is Corrie ten Boom. She's a Dutch Christian who hid Jews during the war. She was caught and Corrie and her sister and her father went to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Her father and her sister Betsy died there. She's an amazing woman and after the war she went and spoke to others about forgiveness. She was speaking in a church in Germany one time and at the end of her talk she recognized the man coming up to her and she could see it was one of the most cruel guards from Ravensbrück. She pictured him as he was then. And as he came up to her, he said, I was a guard at Ravensbrück. He didn't recognize her, but she knew, she recognized him. She could see him, and she remembered walking naked past him. She said she felt so cold and so angry. He said, I've become a Christian now. I know I did some very cruel things, but I've received God's forgiveness for the cruelties I've done. And I ask God's grace for an opportunity to ask one of my very victims for forgiveness. Fraulein Ten Boom, won't you were forgiven? Will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. This total 
unlimited forgiveness. I can honestly say it transforms marriage, family life, all our relationships, all our friendships. God loves you. You are loved. The Son of God, Jesus, gave himself for you. When I understood that, it totally changed my life. And it can change everything for you too. Okay, we just have a few moments here to share our uh, responses, reactions to this. Hopefully you saw some of these themes throughout the video, beginning and ending with these strong statements of the death of Jesus, uh, proving God's love for us. Uh, this, the very dominant theme of Jesus dying to take our sin, substitutionary atonement. Uh, the story there about the the young man's father who died and the suffering and how um, he found solidarity with Jesus because Jesus also suffered. And uh, then Jesus dying to show us how to live this, this last section on in the forgiveness of Christ on the cross, we find the capacity to forgive others as well. So which, which ones of those really resonated with you tonight as you watch this video? And hello to Allison there. Yes, Rosemary. For me, it was the prisoner talking about how he didn't love himself and how he was so blown away that no matter what he had done, God forgave him and loved him more than he loved himself. And that just... Um, just sounds so powerful that there is nothing that we can do to separate ourselves from the love of God. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, almost difficult to, to fathom, isn't it? It is really remarkable. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Rosemary. What else? What resonated with you tonight as you watched that video? I think that last story about forgiveness is just so beautiful. I, I think it's just the most, whenever I hear a story about forgiveness, it's just so moving always. It's, it's the most beautiful thing you can do is, is to forgive people, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, every now and then you'll hear a story of maybe someone's child gets killed by an automobile and then they forgive that person and the power of that is just so amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was beautifully told the woman uh, that had been in the prison in Germany mm -hmm. that uh, she, but she needed God's help to do that, to be able to forgive that man. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought that was a beautiful story and what we all should be trying to learn that lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the example of the cross, the, the inspiration that, that it gives us to yeah. live in love in the same way. Right. I thought one, because earlier story about the priest who it's... Um, up and offered himself in place of the um, of the other um, prisoner. Mm -hmm. It really spoke to the sense of someone loving you so much they would step in and take your, you know, what you were, what was going to happen to you. Yeah. Um, I thought that was, and it was told very well that story. Mm -hmm. it seems That's like. As awful as the Holocaust was, it provides us with an awful lot of spiritual uh, meat to, to, to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Kathy. I think there's a lot to wrestle with in this whole thing, really. Um, and while, you know, I'm, I'm with Sylvia, I love a wonderful redemption story and a forgiveness story. And, and you know, um, those are always my favorites. But there's times when you look at these and if you ask a few more pointed questions, you lead yourself down the wrong path. Like the story of the substitutionary says that basically puts God in the role of the Nazi and says, God was gonna kill you if Jesus didn't step in. And that's hard to reconcile with God's love. And that, you know, um, God's love, I mean, a lot of these things, when you really take them and look at all of the um, implications that are there, uh, they become troublesome. They can become troublesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like there's, there's um, a glimpse of truth in them. And, and, and yet, with each of these atonement theories, if, if pressed too hard, they begin to crack. Yeah. And, and so we, we, we get glimpses of, oh, it seems like this is true. Um, and, and yet, n none of them really contain the whole truth. Right. Um, yeah, I appreciate that statement. Chris, I'm thinking of uh, a couple of years ago when the Amish people forgave the man who killed mm -hmm. um, a couple of the kids in um, Pennsylvania. I'm thinking of the Charleston Nine. I'm thinking of Corey Ten Boom. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly can say that I don't understand that even though I claim to be a believer in Jesus. And um, I, I would say that I aspire to that. Uh, and the only way I'll ever be able to experience what they experienced was to go through that, which in fact, I would not want to go through. Mm -hmm. And that being said, I know I do have numbers of friends who struggle um, not being believers in God or Jesus, when they hear those stories, they go, they can't believe that. And um, I don't feel the need to defend any of that. I'm just saying that sometimes it sounds too good to be true. Thank you, Laconia. I, I would go back to what Kathy was saying, and, and what I think I increasingly see is that every one of these stories can be told the wrong way. Uh, th there is a truth to each of them, but they each can be told the wrong way, and it usually comes down to whether you begin with the wrath or the love of God. Mm -hmm. And if you begin with the wrath of God, the story ends up being twisted the wrong way. Um, so, I mean, I have fought the substitutionary theory of atonement for a long, long time, but I'm actually in some ways coming back to it in, in this sense that as far as almost everybody I know knows there's something wrong with them. Um, and they don't need scripture. They don't need any reference to God or, 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 a, or anyone telling them. They know in their soul there is something wrong with them. Uh, there are sociopaths. <laughs> they, you know, there might be a few exceptions. But for most of us, and certainly for me, it's easy to understand that there's something wrong with me. And, and what I see in the death of Christ is, and he's saying, He's saying, can you see now that God loves you so much that, that that's okay? Um, and, and in that sense, he's substituting, definitely substituting for me. Um, a, a, an act so extravagant that I have to get my mind off of what is wrong with me. But 
but but the first recognition is I, no one needs theology or doctrine or scripture or church to know there's something wrong with them. You know, almost every conscious person in the end realizes, oh, there's something wrong. Uh, and, and, and you have to deal with it. And that's where, you know, the death of Jesus comes in. There are certainly ways to understand the story of Jesus that, um, that help that a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that, Dale. And I, and I did appreciate the note there. It was, you know, they didn't spend much time on it towards the end, but as, as they were referencing the resurrection uh, and that sense that um, the, the bad stuff doesn't get the last word, that there, I, th I think we can think of little, little e evil and capital E evil, that, that e each of us in our own ways as, as individuals wrestle with little e evil in our hearts. As a race, we, we certainly do as well. And then there's, there's also this sense of capital E evil that it not only exists within us, but outside of us and all around of us, all, all around us. And it's systemic and per pervasive and global. And, and, and in some mysterious way, Christ on the cross deals with all of that. And, and begins the end of evil, both little, little E and capital E. And that, that is good news. I would say it took me a long time. Uh, having not grown up in church, I, I think there are benefits to that. And there are also um, challenges to that. My first introduction to the cross as a sophomore in high school was largely wrath oriented. And so it, it was very much bad news, good news. Bad news is I'm a terrible, horrible person. Um, good news, Jesus died for me. And it's taken me a long time to realize that that's, that's really not the gospel. That the, the, the gospel actually begins with good news. The, the good news is that that we are all loved, we are all made in the image of God, created as um, co-regents with him over, over creation. And the, the cross is a continuation of that love, his, his fullest effort uh, to love us. But it, it doesn't begin with you and I are terrible, horrible, no good, rotten people. Um, that, that's, a tough, that's a tough gospel. Okay, it's 8.02. So thank you so much for your comments tonight. Uh, hope you'll continue to reflect on this video. Uh, next week, pull up that slide. Next week, we will pick up this question. How can I have faith? How can I have faith? Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, challenges around that question there, especially as we consider suffering and all sorts of things going on in the world today. I have no doubt that we will answer all those questions within the session <laughs> period that we have next week. No, no Hi, everyone. So Good thank night. you so much for being with us. Good night, night everybody. Good night. Thank you. Happy birthday, Kathy. Bye.